The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you. The numbers would once have been unimaginable. Record levels of spending, debt and deficit. Ontario's 2021 budget came down today with COVID-19 front and center. Tonight, we'll sift through the numbers to figure out where the money went and where it's going next. First, we'll hear from the Minister of Finance, then the opposition critics, and finally, some voices of Ontario small business trying their best to keep on keeping on. It's budget day in Ontario, Wednesday, March 24th, and that's all ahead on the agenda. Well, without further ado, let's show you how your tax dollars are going to be spent over the next fiscal year. Sheldon, if you would, let's show everybody how we intend to spend $173 billion. Yep, that's budget 2021-22. Look at, we're still looking for a lot of jobs in this province. Ontario is still short 305,000 plus jobs that it had in May 2020. So what does the road back look like? Economic recovery? Let's see. Here are the projected growth rates for the province. 4% in this year, 4.3 next year, but going down to 2.5 in the year 2023 and only 2% 2 in 2024. And that means the road back to a balanced budget is going to be trickier. The deficit last year, $38.5 billion, an all-time high. This year, $33.1 billion, and then reducing to 27.7 the following year, and 20.2 billion, no balanced budget until the year 2030. Maybe in part because no tax hikes or program cuts in this budget either. Let's look at some spending highlights, particularly in healthcare and COVID-19. The government says it's spending $51 billion over four years earmarked to protect Ontario's economy. That's jobs and health. Where are they spending it? Well, how about a billion dollars on vaccinations? How about 1.4 billion for PPE? How about $5.1 billion for the hospital sector? For example, a brand new inpatient wing at Peel Memorial in Brampton, a complete rebuild of the Mississauga Hospital, that's Trillium Health Partners, a new inpatient care tower in Etobicoke, a new children's treatment center at Chio in Ottawa and in Chatham-Kent. And then there's $2.6 billion over four years to support building 30,000 new long-term care beds. There are new programs for children and for seniors. The COVID-19 child benefit will now go into a third round and they are doubling the payments. That's $400 per child, $500 if your child has special needs. And for seniors, there's this Seniors Home Safety Tax Credit. For this year only, $30 million, which goes to supporting 27,000 seniors to staying in their homes longer. You know, help them buy stability bars, ramps, that kind of thing. In education, $14 billion of expenditures over the next decade to build and upgrade schools. And we have surely learned during the course of this pandemic how important broadband is. So many students unable to keep up in classes because their internet isn't good enough. So the province is allocating $2.8 billion to build internet infrastructure. Everyone across the province they hope will be connected by the year 2025. How about help for business? The jobs training tax credit for the year 2021, it's a temporary measure, $260 million supporting 230,000 people, but that will give you $2,000 per recipient for up to 50% of eligible expenses. So if you wanna go back to college, Tuition's 4,000 bucks, there's half of it taken care of right there. The Ontario Small Business Support Grant, there's another 1.7 billion in that. Those are those 10 to $20,000 grants to help 120,000 small businesses across the province. And let's finish up on hospitality and tourism, which has really taken it on the chin. 140,000 jobs lost in that sector. There's an additional $400 million in this budget over three years to support those employees. And don't you know, with all the lockdowns, we surely need to get outdoors. Well, there's going to be free entry to Ontario's provincial parks from Monday to Thursday, from May to September. There's some good incentive to get outdoors and see our beautiful provincial parks. It is surely not an enviable task for any finance minister, much less a fiscal conservative one. 
that finds himself overseeing an ocean of red ink. Amidst the pandemic, however, it seems inevitable. Let's hear from the minister responsible. From his office, across the road from the Ontario Legislature at the Frost Block, there's Minister of Finance Peter Bethlen Falvey. He's also the President of the Treasury Board of Cabinet and the MPP for Pickering Uxbridge. And Minister, we're delighted that you could join us and continue this budget night tradition of giving your longest and most in-depth interview to us at TVO. I know that every budget has a mission. What's the mission of this budget? Finish the job, defeat this pandemic. And that's why, you know, I'm investing a billion dollars to vaccinate every Ontarian who wants to be vaccinated. Uh, we want to get our lives back. I think I've heard from so many Ontarians, I just want to get my life back, get back to normal. So that's the primary focus. Uh, but the job's not done yet, Steve. So number one, let's, let's defeat this pandemic. And I'm doing also in ways, uh, unprecedented investments in health, you know, hospital, the vaccines, the testing and tracing, the hospital investments, long-term care, mental health and addiction and uh, for women, and also uh, supporting the economy, uh, putting in a lot of supports for small businesses, uh, tourism and hospitality operators, and, and a lot into the skilled trades. So uh, the number one thing here is we got to defeat this pandemic. We're going to finish the job and uh, then we'll be able to recover much stronger than before. I did listen to what the three opposition leaders had to say in their virtual scrums earlier today, and the criticism seems to be you've written a budget as if the pandemic were near the end, as opposed to us being still sort of right in the middle of it. And they think a lot of people are going to be hurting a year from now, and your eye is not, I guess, laser-like focused enough on them. What's your response to that? Our eyes laser focused on making sure that uh, once we safely uh, inoculate, vaccinate every Ontarian who wants one, and I'm very encouraged that the numbers and more polling shows that uh, more and more people want to get the vaccines, they have more confidence in the vaccines. Uh, I'm very encouraged by that. Uh, we're going to do everything it takes to, to keep people safe, and, and that doesn't stop at the end of the fiscal year or the second fiscal year. That's going to continue. That's a, an unconditional uh, promise from the Premier of Ontario and, and this finance minister. But Steve, I, I also want to highlight that I think it's important to make these unprecedented investments in healthcare. Many things that really over the last couple of decades, we haven't invested enough in our hospital capacity. Uh, we're doing that clearly uh, uh, over the last decade or two investments in our long term care sector. So we're, we're doing that. We're active very much now. And, uh, and also in mental health and addiction, putting in record amounts of money so that the supports, that the, when people really need the access and the support for mental health and addiction, they can get it. And, you know, I think it's great social policy, but I think it's great economic policy because if, if you don't have healthy people, you can't have a healthy economy. So I think these are very wise investments, not only to defeat the pandemic and declare victory, make sure we have enough money should any other variant or any other virus show up, and invest in the long term, both from a health perspective and from an economic perspective. I know originally, before you got into public life, you were a, if I can call you this, a Wall Street and a Bay Street guy. You know, you came from, from the financial services sector. And, you know, the growth rates that you're forecasting into the future are not what you'd call robust. And I keep hearing you say, we are going to balance this budget not by raising taxes on people and not by cutting large amounts of spending. We're going to do it with economic growth. And yet, like, you got to tell me how you think you can get to a balanced budget within a decade with growth rates around 2%, because I'm not seeing it. So help me here. Well, I think, uh, first of all, the nominal uh, growth rates that we projected, particularly in the out years, are 3.9%. Are um, but let me tell you this, I'm, I'm betting on the people of Ontario. I have said in my speech, I'm putting the world on notice that Ontario, which was leading uh, Canada and job growth before the pandemic. I think we've under uh, invested in our, our economy uh, over the last decade or so. Uh, we've been dropping uh, electricity costs. We've been cutting red tape. We've been investing in the great ingenuity and entrepreneur spirit that we have in this province. And Steve, I really think that we have all the ingredients to, to lead the, not only the country in job growth when we come out of this uh, pandemic, under the leadership of Premier Ford and, and our government. But I think we can have a real shot at leading economic growth in North America. I, I just believe that strongly in the people of Ontario. And uh, being in the private sector all these years, 30 years, 
Uh, I've, I've come to see that we have uh, the best talent and the best uh, people, best education system. We're investing in health care. So I'm betting on the people of Ontario. Well, here's where I come in and I say, yes, but you've been very lucky this past year, borrowing you know, money at 1.6% on average, which is just historically, <clears throat> excuse me, historically low rates. I note again that the budget papers say that if, if interest rates go up even one point, that's another 750 million bucks that you're gonna have to borrow, and rates are going to be higher going forward. Your budget documents say that too. So again, how, how concerned should we be about your ability to eventually get us back to balance, which I know you want to do, without raising taxes or massive spending cuts? Well, interest rates have gone up, but we forecasted those rates to go up, and in the budget document, they're there, and they're still historically low, Steve. So we really do have the capacity, the fiscal capacity. What I'm really focused on is today. And we, are, we have a once-in-a-century type pandemic. Our job, it's like being uh, not finishing... Uh, storming the beaches and uh, and winning a war. I mean, we are against, uh, we have a war against invis invisible enemy. Um, we've got to get those vaccines. We want to put them in every arm that wants a vaccine, Steve. And I think that also the logistics and the infrastructure to go with that, that's why I announced the one billion. It doesn't end there, the contact, uh, the trace, uh, contact tracing, but the testing and the rapid testing so uh, that we can continually uh, invest in making sure that it's safe. And uh, I, I really think that uh, there, there's uh, that growth model will work in Ontario. But let me tell you one other thing that we don't really talk much about. Last week, I axed the fax. So the fax machines, uh, known government still has uh, fax machines. So ax the fax. And some people might say you still have fax machines. And that's exactly what I said when I came into government. So, uh, you know, that's, that's a machine like this. You got to put some paper in it. That's the way it works for <laughs> those who are too young to remember. And we still have that. We can do things a lot smarter in this government. We've proven that we can modernize, that we can digitize, that we can cut red tape and do it all the, all the while while we're increasing funding. Because every time I save a dollar on a fax machine, we're putting it right back into health care and putting it right back into long-term care in other areas. I know you don't mean to suggest this, but, you know, the smart aleck in me wants to come back with this question anyway. You're not going to get rid of a $33 billion deficit by getting rid of fax machines, right? There's got to be more to it than... There's got to be a lot more to it than that. Well, absolutely, and, uh, you know, that's, that's true. It's very symbolic, and it's, it's in part to signal that we got to change the culture of government. So we have all these digital tools, and people want services and programs when they want it, where, where they want it. And so let me give you a couple examples. Our Ontario Small Business Grant Program, that's, that's already helped over 100 small... 100,000 small businesses in Ontario that we've given them a grant between ten and twenty thousand dollars. The many have told me that's the difference between keeping the lights on and turning them off. We did that all through one simple website. You can go one simple portal. Uh, not a lot of people, just through a website. You could also apply for some of the other programs we already had. We made it simple and easy. The application was easy. And in case you had any trouble, we overstaffed the customer service desk. We opened it on weekends you know, 8.30 to 5 p.m. When was the last time uh, government was thinking about, on weekends, delivering a product for, for citizens, in this case, small businesses? So I think there's massive opportunity. Uh, I also think we're centralizing procurement, maybe not the most interesting topic, but let me tell you, uh, we believe that we can save over a billion dollars just by centralizing procurement. So <clears throat> it's not headline-grabbing news, but I'm telling you, we're working every day for the people of Ontario to do things better, to do things smarter, and making savings so we can, and really they do add up to billions of dollars and be able to deliver those programs sustainably in the future. And if I can say one last thing, Steve, mm. there is a third thing that uh, I'm highlighting. You know, when we started Medicare all those years ago, and <clears throat> excuse me, you being a student of history would know a lot about it. You know, the initial funding model was 50% federal mm -hmm. and 50% uh, provincial. Now, a lot of things have happened, but we've gotten to the point where now Roughly across the country, it's 22% of uh, ex healthcare expenditures uh, is the uh, provincial share, uh, sorry, the federal share. So we've, uh, I, I've called on Christia Freeland. I think this is a nation building moment to put our healthcare system on a sustainable footing. We have an aging population. We, we're investing in long-term care. We're investing in mental health and addiction. Now's the time and to bring it back up to a more fair share 
And uh, we have suggested all the premiers across the country and territories, 35%. And for Ontario, that would mean 10 billion, over $10 billion of an additional revenue. And I'm really looking for, forward to her budget, Christia Freeland, on April 19th to see what she can do to help uh, us in the health care system. Well, you're quite right. I won't quibble with your numbers because they are right. Uh, the, the federal government is only paying 22, 23 percent of the shot. And I remember in the 60s when Medicare at 50-50 was brought in, John Robarts, the Premier of Ontario, the day said, this is a Machiavellian scheme because he anticipated the day would come when the feds would withdraw their support. Having said that, Minister, uh, the federal, no, the FAO, the Financial Accountability Officer, has said that 97% of COVID relief in the province of Ontario has come from federal coffers. And, you know, the implication is that you guys are kind of dressing up a lot of programs as if you're putting in the lion's share of the money, when the fact is, it's come from the feds. So I hear you on the health transfer, but do you have to give the feds their day on that one? Well, first off, I do give the feds uh, a lot of credit. We've worked very closely together, and I'm very appreciative of, uh, of working together with the federal government. Uh, let me tell you, uh, our Premier Doug Ford led uh, the provinces in negotiating the federal restart program, some $17 billion, and, and Steve, our province received $7 billion. Uh, so there, and we're very grateful for that money. But Steve, last year, our government spent $20 billion in one-time COVID relief on top of the unprecedented increase in base funding. Again, our base funding is gonna increase by 5.4% this year, and we're going to set us, we set aside another 6.7 billion out of provincial coffers. So let me tell you, the people of Ontario, the taxpayers of Ontario, are spending whatever it takes. Of course, we're grateful for any dollars we get from the federal government, and we just want to go back to a fair share between the federal government on a sustainable, not a one-time, time-limited basis, on a sustainable footing for our health care system, because the people of Ontario. Uh, it's their taxes that go to Ottawa. Mm -hmm. So really, this is a fair, uh, fair thing to ask for. Okay, we got a couple of minutes left. Let me see if I can get two more issues in here. Number one, um, okay, this may not be the biggest headline in the budget, but I'm really interested in it. There's 150 million dollars for a local tourism tax credit. When will we have details on how you intend to kind of reward people for doing their traveling within the province of Ontario? So what you're talking about is the Ontario state staycation tax credit, right. we call it, uh, which we're, we're, we're ready to roll out. Uh, what we want to do, though, when the public health measures are safe to be able to, to roll that out. And right now, it wouldn't be safe to uh, attract tourists uh, into this uh, province or ask Ontarians to travel to tourist destination sites. And that's why, uh, Steve, today I announced uh, over a f about $400 million of additional support for our tourism and hospitality sectors, in addition to the over 200 million that we've already put aside, and funding those uh, those institutions who've really suffered uh, because of the pandemic more than most. You know, no tourists, uh, no 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 one to sleep in your your accommodation, your bed and back, back breakfast, travel agents, and so forth. So, um, you know, there's a lot more to do there, and when we can safely reopen, vaccines will do that, and that's why it's so important to get your vaccination. Uh, then uh, then that staycation credit will, will come into force. Okay, jumping in here with one last question. I only got about 30 seconds left. Rob Benzie of the Toronto Star asked you this earlier today, and I thought it was such a good question. I'm just going to crib it from him. Uh, 40 references, I gather, to highways in this budget, but not one reference to Highway 413, which, of course, is very controversial, expected to go across the top of Toronto. Does this suggest that the highway's dead? Well, what this, as I said, uh, then is the environmental. Uh, let's uh, let's have the environmental assessment. Let's consult with all the municipalities, all the stakeholders. And uh, what I would say this as well on highways. Uh, what he didn't mention, I'll take the opportunity to mention. We're building the highways of the 21st century. We made a historic announcement today of investment in broadband. Uh, across this province that we're going to hook up the rest of the province who are underserved or not served at all with broadband. Uh, I announced close to three billion on top of the billion uh, that we've already announced. So uh, this is a historic day for Ontario for broadband. I liken it to the highways and tunnels and bridges and waterways of uh, 100 years ago. I really think, Steve, this is a province building moment. 
and that's uh, we're going to get that job done and hook up all of Ontario. And for other politicians watching, note how one question got asked, but a different question got answered. That was very skillful. Uh, Minister of Finance, Treasurer, Peter Bethlen Falvey, thanks for joining us on TVO tonight. We are grateful. As always, my pleasure, Steve. <laughs> Well, any budget defines a government's priorities, which opposition parties can and do take issue with. But given that much of what's in this year's Ontario budget comes down to COVID-19, does that still hold true? Well, let's find out. We're going to ask all in the provincial capital tonight, Catherine Fife, She's the NDP Finance and Treasury Board critic and the MPP for Waterloo. Mitzi Hunter, the Liberal Finance critic and the MPP for scarborough Guildwood. And Mike Schreiner is here. He is the leader of the Green Party of Ontario and the MPP for Guelph. Good to have you three opposition representatives with us here this evening. Can I just start? Catherine Fife? you're the official opposition. We'll start with you. Initial reaction to something you just heard in Peter Bethlen Falvey's interview. Well, I mean, listen, I, I want to say right off the top that we were very uh, encouraged to see that there was some funding for vaccinations. Nobody in this province believes that the vaccination rollout is going well. Uh, businesses, healthcare professionals, uh, educators have said, listen, we need to get this right and it needs to we need to get you know needles in arms so one billion dollars hopefully this helps uh the race against uh, the variants is real and uh, we need to make sure that people are kept safe that said uh, we would have seen uh, some very strategic investment in keeping people safe uh, that, you know, that the minister just referenced. Uh, for many days now, many months, actually, we've been fighting for paid sick days. And listen, Steve, if people are still going to work uh, sick in Brampton and Peel and Mississauga and KW, uh, then, we were, then we're not going to get through this third wave. Uh, so we understand that uh, there, there was strategic invested. This was a missed opportunity on behalf of the government. And if there was ever a time to be bold and ambitious uh, with any budget, it would be this one. And the federal program on sick days is undersubscribed. It is not working. Let's make sure that we don't have another lockdown. That's what businesses have told us. That's what healthcare professionals have told us. And so this really, unfortunately, was a, a missed opportunity. They would have had our full support. And, and you know, in this all, we're all in this together sort of moment, uh, that, that would have been very encouraging for us to see. Okay, Mitzi Hunter, what would you have seen in that uh, interview that you might want to challenge? Oh, there's a lot that I see in the interview that I would like to challenge. First of all, I think the whole budget is a swing and a miss because this was an opportunity to focus on the things that will set Ontario's up for a strong recovery. You know, we first have to deal with the crisis in the pandemic. I agree that the minister says that's the job right now. But once we have everyone vaccinated, we have to look at the economic recovery. And, and there are key priorities that Ontario families have in investments in education, making sure we don't leave anyone behind, that we close those learning gaps that have occurred because students have been out for a year of disrupted learning. We also, um, you know, we know that women and racialized groups have been the hardest hit for the pandemic. And where is the specificity in this budget to address those concerns that are obvious? You know, so the missed opportunity is that we could have made a generational investment in childcare. We could have recognized cl the climate change crisis and made this a recovery that is a green recovery. There are so many aspects to this budget that uh, is just was very obvious and, and it lacks vision. It also, you know, pins its hope on an economy that is growing, but it doesn't actually do the hard work of making the investments today that produces that economic recovery in the future. Mike Schreiner, your reaction? Yeah, I just think the government is blind to the reality Ontarians are facing. To think that they've cut $4.8 billion in the next fiscal year at a time when we're going into the third wave of uh, COVID, um, we're dealing with the fallout from the pandemic. Um, it appears to me that the finance minister left a few chapters of his budget at the printers. Uh, they mentioned the climate crisis twice, uh, homelessness twice. Uh, let's face it, uh, Steve, people need support to get through this pandemic, and they're going to need support for economic recovery. 
We know people need support for mental health. The government doesn't even meet its own annualized projected spending for that. They've cut public education by $790 million next year. Uh, they have not put in forward a plan for economic recovery that aligns with addressing the climate crisis. And finally, they're not um, addressing and putting the money we need to into things like supportive housing and other ways of addressing the housing affordability crisis across the province. Having said that, Catherine Fife, they are going to spend $173 billion next year. Are you saying that wasn't enough? I'm, I'm saying that to date, actually, they have predicted that they were going to spend money on, for instance, last year's budget also had a broadband investment. That money didn't get spent. Uh, what we have seen consistently from this government is that they say that they're going to come to the table with some money. I mean, we've heard the premier say everything's on the table. Well, it's a pretty small table. And most of those things got knocked off as the, the fiscal situation in the province of Ontario got worse. So uh, the, the 173 with this government, means that you have to follow the money. You have to make sure that they're actually investing. I mean, I did an interview earlier today and Stan Show said they're investing in education. This year alone, $790 million is coming out of the education system. Uh, so, re And also remember, please, Steve, that prior to the pandemic, this was a government that was cutting public health, health care, and education. They were, they were on a full-on assault. Uh, against those public services. And we now know that there is a very strong connection between keeping people healthy and keeping the economy going. So why not be very strategic in keeping people safe on a go-forward basis so that we don't end up uh, at having to shut down the economy again? Because we are in a third wave. We have 1,500 more cases today in the province of Ontario. This budget does not recognize or acknowledge the work that is already happening in healthcare, the stress that is also on that system, or the stress that's actually happening in our education system. There have been, though, Mitzi Hunter, uh, calls from a lot of quarters to raise taxes, particularly on wealthier people, in order to raise more money to spend more money. They haven't raised taxes here. Do you think that was a good move? Well, I don't see the room to raise taxes during the midst of a health pandemic. We've had 220,000 people lose their jobs. And, and so it's just not the, the right time to be talking about that. But, you know, this government does purport to have a budget that balances uh, at the end of this decade. And it concerns me because when you look at the assumptions, you know, the, the growth in programs is just you know, uh, at about 7.7% uh, over six years. And that does not even keep up with the normal rate of inflation or the normal growth in our population and just the normal demands. Um, and they also have a, a very bold assumption of a 21% growth in revenue over those six years. And I would say, well, where is that going to come from? So so the assumptions that have been put forward, um, you know, they, they have a little bit of magic thinking to them and uh and and it does in my view signal a, a pretty horrific um situation that we could be in um should they retain you know uh power after the next election because it's going to mean austerity and a reduction in services that that ontarians would rely on whether it's in long-term care or in the, in the health system in terms of hospitals um we know that we have enormous backlogs right now the ontario medical association uh has put that out uh, we have years worth of backlog in fact because of the situation that the pandemic has caused and and the the investments that are put forward in this budget does not meet the need. And that's the concern that we have. Well, I do want to follow up on that issue of tax increases with Mike Schreiner, because I know for a fact that one former conservative finance minister, admittedly from four decades ago, uh, had a meeting with Peter Bethlen Falvey, I'm talking about Darcy McHugh, and said to him, you know, you could raise the GST, or I guess the HST, by two points, um, and it probably, you, there would not be a big political price to pay, and you'd take in billions of dollars which would help you with some of the spending that you need to do. Obviously, the minister chose not to do that. Do you think he should have? You know what, Steve, at a time when we're facing a once-in-a-century public health crisis that has led to uh, a significant economic downturn, um, I don't think now's the time to be pinching pennies 
looking at raising taxes or the $4.8 billion cut the conservatives are bringing in. Now's the time to make investments. And I can tell you as a small business owner, you know, there are times you borrow money to make investments and you have to make smart investments so you have a good return on investment. And that's exactly the place Ontario is right now. And so the challenge is, is the fact that the government is cutting too early when we're not out of the pandemic yet, because we know getting the public health crisis under control is the best way to get our economic recovery to happen. And the fact that there's like nothing in this budget really talking about what economic recovery can look like. And let me just give you one example. To the Finance Committee over the summer, so many people said, invest in a green building retrofit program. It'll create jobs, help kickstart the recovery. So an economic analysis says the province puts in $5 billion, that'll leverage $80 billion of private capital investment, create over 800,000 jobs, help people and businesses save money by saving energy and reduce climate pollution all at the same time. But the finance minister left that chapter of the budget at the printers, because I didn't see it today. Hmm. Catherine Fife, if there were one thing you would like to have seen in the budget that you didn't see, what would it be? Well, there's so much. I mean, listen, the the care tax credit that the government is, you know, shopping out as a solution to get women back into the workforce, and we know that women have been disproportionately affected, uh, is not going to work because the, those childcare spaces don't exist. So if the government truly understood that when you do invest in early learning and care for every dollar, there's a $7 return to the economy, this would be a smart investment. Uh, our, our Green New Democratic deal also has a retrofitting plan. I mean, let's get small businesses uh, back to work in local communities. Uh, the minister mentioned procurement, Steve. We have an amazing company in Kitchener-Waterloo called Canadian Shield. Uh, they did exactly what the government asked them to do at the beginning of the pandemic. They created PPE locally, quality PPE, affordable. Uh, they can't get their product into our own healthcare system. So, you know, there are some, there are some low-hanging fruit that makes perfect sense. We shouldn't be creating jobs in other jurisdictions. We should be creating jobs right here in Ontario. Mitzi Hunter, I wonder, as you look at the path back to balance, and I ask you this, you're, a, uh, I guess, a former junior finance minister in Ontario. Um, how concerned should we be that this province plans to take on billions and billions more in debt by the time we actually get to the end of the decade when they say the budget will be balanced? Are you concerned about that? <laughs> I mean, it is uh, it is concerning because you want to make sure that that this is something that we can afford uh, to to do in terms of our our net debt to GDP. So the size of our economy relative to our spending, and and I did take a look at that line, and and it looks as if it's uh, it's staying. Uh, in the right direction and, and getting under the 50% uh, mark. So, you know, I have confidence in, in the people of Ontario. Um, the finance minister said earlier that, you know, they want to be uh, number one in growth uh, in North America. Well, you know, we, we've experienced that under the former Liberal government. We were number one in the OECD in terms of economic growth. And we had, you know, the lowest unemployment rate in a decade, in 40, 40 years, actually. And we also had uh, the number one jurisdiction for foreign direct investment. So, so I believe that we have to have those ambitions for our province, but they only come with the right sets of priorities. And I can't emphasize this, this enough. We cannot have a recovery where parts of our, our population, you know, advances and bounce back quickly while others lag. You know, we talk about building back better. Well, that has to happen together. And, and that's where this budget falls so far short, that there are so many groups that have been disproportionately impacted by this pandemic. You, you look at the effects on, for instance, uh, racialized communities. You look at the effects on women, on youth. You know, our, our youth unemployment rate is at 22 percent, and there's no vision in this budget for the young people in Ontario to make sure that they don't have a lagging scarring effect from the current economic recession that we're facing. And so, you know, we, we have to do better. And uh, and if we're going to to have 
uh, deficits uh, for, for years to come, then they better be spent wisely and, uh, and setting us up for a better future and well, not leaving anyone behind. Well, Mike Schreiner, let me play devil's advocate here. I mean, I'm looking at the, some of the budget papers here right now. A COVID-19 child benefit, they're going in for a third round of that. The Seniors Home Safety Tax Credit, uh, they're going to bring that in to help seniors stay in their homes longer. Jobs Training Tax Credit, uh, you know, to let people go back to college if they want to. You're a former small business guy. They've got a small business support grant here, ten to twenty thousand dollar grants. I mean, does that mean anything for you? Well, one of the things I did push the finance minister on when I met with him a few weeks ago was extending the Ontario Small Business Support Grant. So I was happy to see a second round of that. But there's still a number of small businesses, uh, dry cleaners, caterers, uh, a, a number of uh, healthcare professionals, a number of small businesses that are still excluded from that program and desperately needing help. And the bottom line, Steve, is, is if we're going to get Ontario out of this fiscal hole, we have to build back in a smart way. And the premier's approach so far has been environmentally destructive proposals that are blowing up in his face, whether it's building an Amazon warehouse on wetlands that people have said no to, whether it's Highway 413, which people are saying no to. The bottom line is, is we need economic growth. We need economic recovery. We need to make those investments, but we have to make sure we make those investments in a way that strengthen our communities, connect our communities, address the climate crisis, ensure that young people have a livable future, protect us from other threats that are coming, such as increase in flooding uh, caused by the climate crisis. Those smart investments will set us up, and now is the time to make them when interest rates are at historic lows and we need to get people back to work. Well, we've got three small business people on deck right now who will certainly weigh in, uh, I think, somewhat critically on this budget. So um, we're going to hear from them now. But I do want to thank the three opposition critics for coming in tonight and sharing their views on this. Catherine Fife from the NDP, Mitzi Hunter from the Liberals, Mike Schreiner from the Greens. Hope you three stay safe. And again, thanks for continuing the Budget Night tradition here on TVO. Absolutely. Thanks, Steve. Hi. All right, then. We've heard from the politicians on all sides, but where the rubber meets the road for many people looking at today's budget, can their business, their employers, their employees hang on until better days arrive? Well, let's ask three small business people facing exactly those questions. In Thunder Bay, Ontario, Tony Muya, owner of Serenity Salon and Wellness. In the nation's capital, Michael Wood, small business advocate and a partner with the company Ottawa Special Events. And here in the provincial capital, Ginger Robertson, co-owner of the Edmund Burke Pub and Off the Hook Restaurant, both in the city's east end. And we're really grateful to you three for coming on to TVO tonight and sharing your wisdom with us. We want to start by just putting a little bit of background on the record for you and our viewers to get a hold of here. Sheldon, let's bring this graphic up. In the year 2020, 58,000 small businesses closed their doors. Thank you, COVID-19. Today, one in six, that's about 181,000, are at risk of closing for good. 62% of businesses in Canada report being fully open. 44% of businesses report being fully staffed. The average small business is now $170,000 in debt. And Canada could lose 20% of its small businesses by the end of the pandemic as a direct result of the virus, so says the Canadian Federation of Independent Business. All right, let's go through this. Tony, start us off. How bad has COVID-19 been for your business? It's been absolutely catastrophic, not just business-wise, but personally. Um, what, what, what's happened for us is our numbers are so far down, it's, it's crazy. Uh, what's worse more than our numbers being down is what the Ontario government has done to really ruin the importance of being a hairstylist or a spa technician in Thunder Bay. Um, we are only four different businesses that are still closed in the gray zone. So many of my friends and I, we walk around and uh, think, you know, we're almost better off dead than we are alive. We're worth more dead than we are alive. Like the movie, It's a Wonderful Life. It's sad. Uh, my numbers are so far down I'm down over $70,000 just in the first three months of this year. We've only been open for two weeks. Hmm. And what the government proposed today with the new budget of an additional ten dollars to $20,000 doesn't even scrape the surface. It, it's not going to help us at all. That's not even close to what we were thinking was going to happen. Okay, Tony, thank you for setting the scene. We'll obviously follow up and, and find more details as we go along. Michael, how about you? What's your story? 
I can echo a lot of what Tony just said. I own Ottawa Special Events. We are an event rental company, so we rent stages and sound and lighting, pipe and drape, tables, chairs. And, you know, with the crushing numbers of public gatherings, it's, it's really hard for us to operate. In 2020, we were down 97%, which equates to over $3 million. And we unfortunately had to lay off our entire staff of 22 people last March. And except for some piecemeal stuff here and there, we haven't been able to bring anybody back yet. If you're down 97%, how are you even alive at all? It's a great question. You know, we've uh, been able to negotiate with uh, some of the creditors along the way. And at the same time, too, we've had the odd thing come in. Our, our landlord, at the time when landlords perhaps weren't being as favorable to small business as others, ours was incredible. Ours said they were right there with us. And so, you know, we've worked really hard to get the little amount of business to cover our operating costs. Gotcha. Ginger, how about you? What's COVID done to your two establishments? Well, uh, off the hook, I we purchased uh, March 9th of 2020. You're kidding. <laughs> no, so uh, it was devastating right off the hop for us. That graphic you threw up at the beginning is a, you know, a painful reminder of how much trouble we're actually in. And some of those permanently closed businesses were are some of my friends, you know, in the business. And what was announced today is it's pathetic. The word is pathetic, eh? Yep. We didn't even get the grant that they were talking about it off the hook because um, we own the second business and we're considered an enterprise. So uh, we're only going to get support for one of our restaurants and not the other. It's like saying you have a house at a cottage and now you're a real estate mogul. Now it's, it's, it's so unfair. Okay, explain that to us. How come you only get for one property but not for the other? Because there's uh, some fine print in the application that states that if your corporate structure uh, is similar in your two businesses, and in my case, my husband and I own both restaurants 50-50, so the, the, we are considered a related enterprise, and therefore uh, one of the businesses is denied. Hmm. Do I take it if you had to do it again, you, you would not have purchased the other business you did on... March the 9th of last year? Well, hindsight's always 2020. Right? Ain't it, though? 2020 in the year 2020. Yikes. Um, okay, Mike, do I, do I hear this right? You actually partook in budget consultations with either the Minister or the Ministry of Finance. Can you take us through that? Absolutely. So I was fortunate to be one of the people in Ottawa that was selected to present the case, the small business case, to the Minister of Finance. On that call was also the mayor and the board of trade and, and other key stakeholders in the business world in, in Ottawa. And, you know, I was able to present some key things that I thought were extremely important. The idea, Steve, that this grant program, that one size fits all, it just doesn't work. So that was one of my key speaking points that we need the grant to you know, run a second time, maybe a third time, depending on these variants and uh, other things, you know, more education. If people lose their businesses through no fault of their own, they should be awarded the opportunity to go back to post-secondary and re-educate themselves for a new career. So it was a great experience and, uh, you know, I went and traded for the world. How much of that advice did you see reflected in today's budget? Great question. I obviously the grant came out that if you had qualified once, you would get it again. Uh, we see that there's more training. I also spoke very similar to the federal HASCAP program uh, for hard, highly affected sectors. You know, I did ask for something for the province to do the same, and you know, we did see something for the travel and tourism world that will be made announced. Uh, announcement will be coming shortly. Okay, Tony, let me go back up to you in northwestern Ontario. Uh, the government did announce today a second round of the small business support grant payments that's ten to twenty thousand dollars a billion seven altogether if you consider the entire province how helpful will that be to your efforts um as far as the twenty thousand dollar grant that the ontario government is going to uh, give us hopefully if we qualify um, i think that's great although what i really would like to see is what the federal government has done with their forty thousand dollar loan with a twenty thousand dollar grant if we could repay the forty thousand which absolutely nobody can unless we take a loan out, is not going to happen. 
Um, so we like to see the Ontario government to lean on the federal government to turn that loan into a grant for us as well of non-repayment. Only for the businesses, I will add, in my opinion, that are still closed because some businesses have been allowed to reopen and do have cash flow coming in. We have zero cash flow coming in. My biggest uh, issue here and our Federation of Hairdressers and, and uh, Barbers in Thunder Bay is the future of our industry. Um, we, we are going to face an absolute onslaught of people getting out of our industry that are already in it and people not wanting to become hairstylists because at the end of the day, we're not essential. The next time there's a pandemic, the next time there's anything, what the government has painted our hairdressing community and spa and gyms is we are not necessary at all. How long have so you been doing this? We're, I've been doing this for 32 years. 32 and years. So all, tell 32 me, years. Talk to us about the next generation, though. You, you've been at this a long time. Would you give advice to anybody to go into this line of work today? Unless the Ontario government and the federal government put forth some kind of platform that makes our industry a viable industry that can work? Absolutely not. I would not recommend anybody to get into this industry because I had a full book uh, making great money. I felt so important to my guests. My guests love coming in. And at this point right now, our industry is nothing. We're deemed as we don't need you. And it's just seemed like it's been six and a half months that we've been closed out of 12 and at the end of the day, the government has shown no effort whatsoever, even when I read all the money that they're putting forth to retrain people. But how about some money putting forth to put the confidence back into the next generation of kids coming up and young adults to actually get into our industry? Because it is an amazing industry. There's nothing in this budget that allows for money to bring back the sense that this is an actual professional industry. That's a viable, necessary industry. And that's a big shortfall for Mr. Ford and his cabinet today. Ginger, I got a bit of a tricky question for you here. So uh, buckle up, mm. as they say. We're a year <laughs> into this pandemic. How would you describe this premier's record on assisting small business? Uh, am I giving him a grade? It's not a good one. <laughs> like if we ran our businesses uh, this way, we we wouldn't be in business. I mean. I don't think you can, like, let's just take all of the relief on all levels of government right now. There, It's based on revenue. So we bought a business that was around for 10 years. The last two years of that business wasn't great. Uh, the, the previous owner wasn't open. You know, the same hours we are, we're open longer than he is. We, um, we have more, we have a bigger menu. Um, there's lots of reasons why our revenue is up, but revenue doesn't equal profit. You're talking about a whole slew of other expenses. We have takeout containers. We have all this PPE. We, there's like a, a whole giant sector of stuff we have to buy that we'd never, you know, had to do before. So revenue being up is not a good indicator that someone's, you know, doing great. No, we're, I hear we're you. Not. We're surviving. I hear you. But the government also says... We are helping people have an online presence. They've spent millions on that. They've said that they're, they've been prepared to help people purchase PPE and other specifics to, to retrofit your establishment to make it more COVID-19 friendly, if I can put it that way. Has any of that been helpful? I mean, you know, a box of gloves that used to cost $50 is now 280 So that $1,000 is pretty much gone in a month, hmm. uh, just from disposable items, masks, all the things. Um, so, you know, I'm grateful for anything that we're, that we are given, but I, I agree. It's not a one size fits all for everybody. Like we, um, we're like, we're not, you shouldn't be basing it just strictly on revenue. This has to be on a case by case basis in some instances for sure. Um, you know, like the selling, uh, us being allowed to sell alcohol. I can't go online. I, I sell wings and fish and chips like that's we do take out and that's all we can do the pub we closed because we were losing money every day uh hmm. it's not it's a place you go to socialize it's a lot of regulars it's a it's an industry bar so for us that's you know we obviously can't go online um yeah so i don't know i just feel like uh, the selling of alcohol there's an lcbo across the street from my restaurant no one's coming in to buy retail priced alcohol when they can go across the street and get it for less so uh, that's not that's not a big help capping delivery fees i will say if that actually happens 
would be a huge help. But we have to remember there was five months before this, which is where we all accumulated our debt, where we didn't get any help when the landlords uh, weren't giving us a break on rent because it was up to them to decide. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, we didn't there was no there were no loans. There were no grants. There was no PPE. We did all that already um, without help. That's where we all got into trouble. Michael, let me ask you what you think the province could be doing that isn't doing yet that you think would be helpful. Well, I've been advocating for small business for a year now. And, you know, one of the things that Ginger just said was that alcohol being purchased in a restaurant is at a retail price. I think if we want to help the restaurants, you know, there really is not a cost, if you will, a cost price for alcohol for restaurants and bars. There's some savings, but not significant enough. So I think that if the government were to go back and re-examine the relationships between the hospitality world and the LCBO, I think that would be helpful. I think that we're going to continue to need energy support um, for hydro and gas moving forward. And one of the things, you know, getting back to the presentation towards the province, that, you know, the gap in rent, in the rent subsidy, you know, I did ask the province to backfill that. You know, there's 35 percent in rent that small business owners need to still come up with. And if you're like Tony and myself and you have limited to no cash flow, I don't know where that 35% is supposed to come from. So, you know, I'm going to continue to push the government for more support, more financial support. And, you know, as this continues for Steve, I think we're going to need a lot of mental health support moving forward as well. Mm -hmm. Well, there is something that, uh, in today's budget that does speak to that. But I want to get back to the premier for a second because, you know, we haven't had that many premiers of Ontario who have been small business operators. Um, but this guy was. I mean, this guy had a family business. He, they made, you know, decals. So the thinking was he surely ought to understand the plight of small business people in the province. Do you think he does? Well, that's a great question, and, and a lot of people have asked me this. You know, when it comes to the lockdowns, I've always tried to have a balanced approach. I've been very fortunate. I've met with many people in the premier's office uh, and other ministers by taking a balanced approach. I had a conversation with somebody last night, and I said, I understand that as small business owners, we're not in the room while decisions are being made. We don't have all of the facts. So the facts that are made available, yes, we can either agree with or disagree with. And I think this is where small business needs to be at the table for these discussions. And so we can actually hear and ensure that everything that moving forward does help us because there are a lot of people that need a ton of support. And I truly hope that the premier does remember his days as a small business owner and can provide that for us. Tony, let me get you back in here. Do you think, given the changes you know you are capable of making, do you think you could reopen your, your salon tomorrow and it would be a safe place for your customers to come? Uh, we've been a safe place since day one. Um, we followed the guidelines that our local health unit, in conjunction with the provincial government, put into place. We spent thousands of dollars in plexiglass in between stations, front desk. We, we, we spent so much money on PPEs in our salon. Having said that, being a business which right from the get-go, we are one of the cleanest industries out there. We are constantly regulated by our health unit. So we were set up from that last March. So when we got closed down again, there is nothing else that the government can put into place that makes our business any safer than what it was a year ago. It's that's it. There's nothing else we can do. All right. Zero. So I got to ask did, you the follow-up question then, which is, again, this is a premier who is a small business person, who understands the plight of small business. What does he, in your view, not get about what's going on right now? Um, I think the premier of Ontario needs to actually walk into some hair salons and see what we've done. And the one thing that I have suggested to my colleagues here in Thunder Bay and surrounding area is you have to cut your staff down. I did. I only brought half of my staff back when we were allowed to open, and I went from five days a week to seven days a week instead of eight-hour days to 12-hour days, and we spread everybody out. If everybody does that, and if the premier was to put that in their mandate, that once you do get the green light to open up again, it's not 220 miles down the interstate at once. You have to come back slow. You have to social distance properly. And if we do that, there's no reason why my doors are closed. I'm happy with coming back to work with myself working in the salon, and so are my clients. 
I don't understand why the Premier keeps saying that it's not a safe place. It is. And that's where, again, so many people are wondering, okay, so what do we have to do as hairstylists and barbers to make this a safe place? There's nothing else safer. Tony, I, I hear the, uh, you know, I hear the adamance and the force in your position. Did you think about opening up illegally and saying to hell with it? Absolutely. I was going to do that actually three weeks ago. Um, the local television station was here. We had done the report. I had my client. I was just about to cut her hair. And my lawyer phoned me. And my lawyer advised me against it because of the figure that I am in the community and facing the legal ramifications that I would. Um, I was going to open up illegally. Um, and I decided against it with the... Um, uh, my lawyer telling me not to. Uh, because I'm at a point where there is nothing that Doug Ford or his cabinet or the health unit could say, this is what you need to do now so you can open up. We're ready. There's nothing else we could do. There isn't. So I don't know what he's waiting for. I, I, we're, we're at a wit's end. Um, we just feel like this government is, is like a gambler who goes to a casino, loses all of his money and only has $20 left in his pocket and instead of thinking, okay, I got that 20 bucks, I made all these mistakes, let me take those $20, go home and start investing and, and start building my money up again, I'm just going to blow it all. It's almost like the premier knows he's dropped the ball, so does his cabinet, so does our health unit, but they're too proud to admit they dropped the ball in our sector to let us go back to work, so they're just going to keep us closed. And well, that is wrong. Tony, Michael, and Ginger, I can't thank you enough for joining us tonight and giving our viewers and our listeners some sense of what you've been up against over the last year. And needless to say, I wish all of you just great good fortune going forward. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And that is the agenda for Wednesday, March 24th, 2021. For more of TVO's Budget 2021 coverage, you can always check out our website. That's TVO.org. Tomorrow, we will hear from Ontario's Financial Accountability Officer on why he says the province's housing programs leave much to be desired. And we'll examine efforts to address homelessness during the COVID-19 crisis. Hope you'll join us for that. I'm Steve Pakin. Thanks for watching TVO, for joining us online at TVO.org and we'll see you again tomorrow. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.